Hey you guys, this is Mr. Millings, and what does a brass trumpet, some salt water, an old bronze helmet, some Gatorade, and air all have in common? Well, all of these things in front of us are solutions. They are mixtures, or homogeneous mixtures, of different components. For example, if we take a look at the uh, brass trumpet here, uh, we know that brass is an alloy. It is a, a mixture of two or more metals. In this case, brass is made up of copper and zinc nice and evenly mixed together. So a sample of the copper here from this trumpet will be identical to a sample of the copper here from this trumpet. Same with the salt water right here, right? We know that salt water is a mixture, a homogeneous mixture or a solution that contains water or H2O along with salt or sodium chloride. These two substances are not chemically bonded together. They are just homogeneously mixed together to form a solution of salt water. This bronze helmet, same thing. What is bronze made out of? Bronze is an alloy that is made out of copper and tin. Evenly mixed together so a sample of this helmet here will be identical in composition to a sample of the bronze from this helmet up top here. Gatorade, same thing. Gatorade is also a solution, a homogeneous mixture in which the components that make up this Gatorade are nice and evenly mixed throughout. So that way a sample of Gatorade from up here will be exactly the same in composition as the sample of Gatorade from the bottom here. And we know that Gatorade is made up of several different pure substances. We've got water, we've got some sugar or sucrose, and last but not least, we will have some salt of some kind, all nice and evenly mixed along with some other uh, pure substances. Okay, last but not least, we have the air that we breathe in. The air that we breathe in should be the same up here as it is down here. Every breath of air that we inhale into our lungs is pretty much the same. So it's air that we breathe in is a solution or a homogeneous mixture of several different components. In this case, we're breathing in nitrogen gas we're breathing in oxygen gas, we're breathing in some hydrogen gas, and if you're in a classroom and somebody just got done eating some Taco Bell, you might be also inhaling some methane gas as well. These four gases, they're not chemically bonded together, they are just mixed together nice and evenly, forming a solution of air. So in this unit, we're gonna be talking about solutions. And when we talk about solutions, there are two main parts to a solution. We have the solvent, and we have the solute. Take for example some salt water, a homogeneous mixture or a solution of salt water. So in this picture here we have a beaker of water and right here we have a pile or a little mound of salt. It can be any salt but for this purpose of this uh, example here we'll use good old-fashioned table salt. All right, so we have some water here and we have some salt here. And what we're gonna do with this salt is we're gonna put it in this beaker here and we're gonna stir it up, right? We're gonna stir it up and make a solution of salt water. All right, so eventually we are gonna have a solution of salt water. And it's gonna be nice and evenly mixed. So that way uh, a sample of the salt water solution here will be identical to a sample of the salt water solution here. All right, so the two main parts of a solution are the solvent and the solute. So which of these two would be the solvent and which of these two would be the solute? Well, the solvent people would be the water. Okay, the H2O here is going to be your solvent. The solvent is the thing that is doing the dissolving. You can think of it that way. The solvent is also the substance that is present in the greatest quantity. That leaves this salt here, the NaCl that we're putting in here in this solution of salt water is going to be your solute. The solute is typically the substance in a solution that is present in the smallest quantity and you can think of the solute as the substance that is being dissolved. So in this little solution of salt water here we have the solvent which is water and the solute which in this case would be the table salt. If I were going to make a solution of sugar water the water once again would be the solvent and the sugar would be the solute. And in this unit, we are gonna be dealing with solutions in which water is the solvent. And what do we call a solution in which water is the solvent? Well, whenever we have a solution in which water is the solvent, we will have what is known as an aqueous solution. Okay, and whenever we have an aqueous solution, H2O 
is always the solvent. So for example, this solution here would be an aqueous solution of salt water. All right, and in this chapter or in this unit, we are going to be dealing with aqueous solutions, solutions in which the solvent is always going to be water. When we talk about solutions, solutions can either be unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated. So what is the difference between each one of these? Well, let's take a look at what an unsaturated solution is. We have three beakers that are sitting here. In this first one here, we have uh, an unsaturated solution. In the second one, we're going to end up having a saturated solution. And in this third one here, we're going to end up having a supersaturated solution. So what is an unsaturated solution? In an unsaturated solution, we've got a solution that has not quite reached its saturation point. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's suppose I have some salt here in this little salt shaker. And we shake out just a little bit of salt in here. And we go ahead and we stir it up, right? We're going to stir this salt up, right? Well, it hasn't quite reached the total amount of solute that can be dissolved in it. It is considered to be unsaturated. If I wanted to, I can still continue to add more and more salt and stir this little solution up, and the salt will dissolve in it no problem. All right, so an unsaturated solution is a solution in which you can still add more solute to the solution and continue to dissolve it more. In a saturated solution, we have a solution in which the solution has reached its its limit of the amount of stuff that can be dissolved in it so let's suppose i continue to shake and shake and shake more and more and more and more salt out of this salt shaker i keep stirring it i keep stirring it and i keep stirring it and it keeps dissolving and it keeps dissolving well there will become a point at which no more salt can dissolve in this solution no matter how much we stir it no matter how uh how much uh we break apart the salt crystals into uh into smaller little crystals, there's going to be a limit to the amount of salt that can be dissolved in this little beaker of water here. And eventually what's going to end up happening is we're going to have a pile of salt that will begin to develop at the bottom of this little beaker right here. Okay. In this example here, we will have a saturated solution. The solution has reached the limit of the amount of solute that can be dissolved in it. All right, so that is what a saturated solution is. In a supersaturated solution, here's what we end up having. We take a beaker of water, and what we're going to do is we're going to raise the temperature of this water. So we're going to increase the temperature of this water while we're dissolving more and more salt in here. So we're going to continue to dissolve more and more salt. And in fact, as we'll learn later on this unit, as you increase the temperature of a solution or the solvent, you can, in fact, dissolve more and more solute. So by raising the temperature of this, uh, of this solution here, or of this solvent here, we're going to be able to dissolve more and more and more, way more solute than we did over here into this solution. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue dissolving more and more and more of this salt in this beaker of water right here. Uh, as we continue to raise the temperature and then what we're going to do is we're going to end up cooling the temperature we're going to end up cooling the temperature of this solution okay so at first we're going to start to raise the temperature we're going to add a ton of this salt or solute to this solution and then we're going to cool this solution down and what ends up happening is you have a tremendous amount of solute dissolved in this solution here and uh, as you cool the uh, solution down, what ends up happening if you add more and more of this salt to it is that the solution, uh, the salt ends up falling out of the solution or the salt will end up precipitating out of the solution. And what we'll end up having is a bunch of crystals that will ultimately end up forming just like we see right here. All right, so unsaturated solutions haven't quite reached the limit of the amount of solute that can be dissolved in them. In a saturated solution, you have reached the limit of the amount of solute that can be dissolved in the solution and you'll typically see this pile up at the bottom kind of like an old bowl or uh, not an old bowl but a bowl of cheerios that you're going to eat right you pile on the sugar or uh, or some cornflakes you pile on the sugar and what's left over a saturated solution of milk and sugar at the bottom right and over here we have a super saturated solution right we've got a solution in which we've raised its temperature we've we're able to dissolve a, a lot more salt than we normally could have and then we end up cooling the temperature down and what ends up happening is that if you continue to add more at that cooler temperature the uh, the solute might precipitate out 
and form some sort of crystal structure in that little beaker. All right, so there is unsaturated versus saturated versus supersaturated. So let's now talk about factors that can affect the rate of dissolution. What does this word mean right here, dissolution? Well, you can just think of this word right here as the same thing as dissolving. So we want to look at factors that affect the rate of dissolving a solute in a solvent. So we have a beaker of water right here. Here's my beaker of H2O. And we have a sugar cube right here. If I simply place this sugar cube in this water right here, it's going to float to the bottom. It's going to float to the bottom here because it's more dense than water. And it's just going to sit there, right? It might be quite some time before this sugar cube ends up dissolving. But what can I do to speed up the rate of dissolving this sugar cube in this water here? Where there are three factors that affect the rate of dissolving a solid solute in a liquid solvent. Okay, what are those three factors? Well, let's take a look. What I can do is I can take a hammer to this sugar cube here. I can smash it all up into this pile right here. And basically what I've done is I've increased the surface area. So the first thing I could do is I can increase the surface area of the sugar and now if I take this and I dump it in this beaker right here it's going to have a, a lot better time or a, a, a lot better ability to dissolve in this water right here, right? So what's the second thing I can do to increase the rate of dissolving? I can take this little stir rod right here and stir up this solution, right? If I stir up the solution, from prior experience we know that this sugar will dissolve in this water, right? If you get a glass of tea at a restaurant and you ask for some sugar packets just dumping those sugar packets in there isn't going to really do much but if you grab a spoon and start stirring that mixture up you'll notice that that sugar is going to dissolve so a second way that we can increase the rate of dissolving a solid solute in a liquid solvent would be to stir it and third and finally what we can do is put a little flame under here we can heat this solution up right if we heat this solution up this sugar in this uh, solution of sugar water is going to have a lot easier time dissolving. So increasing the temperature, increasing the temperature. will increase the rate at which this sugar will dissolve. Let's take a look at factors that will affect the rate of dis dissolution or dissolving a gaseous solute in a liquid solvent. So let's suppose I have some soda. Right? And we know that the gas that is in soda is carbon dioxide gas. Right? It's got carbon dioxide gas. There's also some uh, solid components that are dissolved in this soda. We've got some sugar. But we're mostly concerned with this right here. We want to know how we can increase the rate at which the uh, carbon dioxide gas or bubbles will dissolve in this little can of soda. Well, there's two ways we can do this. The first way is we can decrease the temperature. If we decrease the temperature, we can increase the rate at which the carbon dioxide gas will dissolve in this can of soda here. Another way that we can increase the rate of dissolving a, uh, a gaseous solute in a liquid solvent is we can increase, we can increase the pressure. Right, we can increase the pressure, and from our experience, we know that there is a great deal of pressure in this can. If I flip this little tab up here, what do we hear? We hear a little hissing noise, right? As all of those carbon dioxide uh, gaseous molecules that are dissolved in this liquid solvent end up falling out of the solution and, and, uh, and, and are no longer dissolved in that can and end up leaving this can right here, right? So one way that we can uh, dissolve more quickly a gaseous solute in a liquid solvent would be to increase the pressure uh, the other way would be to decrease the temperature so here are some solution basics people and I hope this was helpful